everyone. Um, so before we get started, um, a few little housekeeping notes. Um, we just ask everybody to silence their cell phones. Um, and also I want to say a few thank yous um, to Sue Barber, Stephen Reynolds, Chris Gruthison, and the staff at the Grazer Kunstverein in Graz, Austria, Dalen Short Farnham and the staff at Altman Siegel Gallery, Meg Malloy and the staff at Sikkima Jenkins and Company, Alex Gartenfeld, Belinda Keeland, the Sakasa family, Laura Reynolds and Quincy Lee, Sarah Vanderbeek, Bud Rosen, Dylan Kyle and Sam Lassiter, and Andrew and Robin Schermeister, who were all very helpful to us in making this exhibition possible. Um, I'd also like to thank the staff and uh, trustees here at the Contemporary Arts Museum Houston who give us so much support. Um, so I'm also very delighted to be here with Matt Keegan and Kay Rosen, um, who are longtime friends. They've known each other for more than a decade. Um, and this exhibition, really conversations about this exhibition started for us probably a little more than four years ago. Um, the exhibition that you see, a traveling show, the heart of it is really a mail exchange between Matt and Kay that began about eight years ago into their decade-long friendship. Um, and Matt, I think maybe to, well, I can, we can also say that both of them have really incredible and extensive international exhibition records. Um, and it's, a, it's really been a, a total pleasure to work together. But maybe if you can, if you can start and talk a little bit about how the, how the project started, that would be great to give people some background. Okay, so um, in 2007, I wrote an article for a publication called Art on Paper for uh, about Kay's work and a LA-based photographer named Shannon Ebner. And um, the focus of the article was work that both Kay and Shannon were making around that time um, in response to the initial years of the war in Iraq. And um, coincidentally, very soon, um, it was either soon after or right before the magazine went to print, I met Kay at White Columns, which is a nonprofit space in uh, New York. And the director of the space named Matthew Higgs introduced Kay and I, and I said, I just wrote about your work. Um, which Kay likes to joke is the best way to meet any artist to say, I just wrote about your work. Good yeah, good pickup line. Um, so we started meeting for lunch and dinners when Kay would come into town from Gary, where um, she comes to New York with frequency, thankfully. And um, so we developed a pretty immediate friendship um, that started in 2007, and two years later in 2009, I asked Kay if she would be open to starting a, a mail correspondence, a physical mail correspondence, um, and that there were no rules to it, no parameters, just that we could start mailing each other um, whatever we chose um, at a pace that suited us. Um, and see where it goes. And thankfully, she was open to it. And um, so again, that started in 2009 and is ongoing. So what you see is the excerpts in the three vitrines is just a, a fraction of what we've been you know, exchanging for seven years now. And for those of you who may not have had a chance to, to take a look, that material um, is sent through the mail um, from Matt's studio in Brooklyn to Kay's studio in Gary, Indiana. Um, you'll see collages, some found objects, clippings, photographs, a, a real great variety of, of works. Um, and maybe you guys can talk a little bit about some of the, some of the very first things that, that made their way through to give people a sense of, of some of the some of the ways that the conversation has has developed. Well, uh, Matt uh, initiated it as, as we established, and um, I just want to say I was really excited about doing this project because Matt is a more collaborative artist and works with 
alone as well as with other artists, and I'm a more solitary artist. So it was a wonderful opportunity to work with somebody in this way. Um, I also love the idea of responding to a given thing. Um, I dry collages, and it was like responding to found material. So it was really an exciting project to begin with, and of course it got more exciting as we went along. But the first thing Matt sent me, is that what you want, you want to talk about, like the very first It'd be item? Fun. Yeah, he sent a, a, a page from an old dictionary, which was an index of, abbrevi of abbreviations that would be used throughout the dictionary. And I, in turn, chose one, which was fig, <laughs> fig, period, and, um, and responded by, you want me really to go into the details? Sure. Okay. Um, there was a picture of a Jasper Johns in the newspaper, uh, a gray tonal one, and under it it had fig, you know, figure one, I believe, right? Yeah. And anyway, I traced it onto other paper and it, it, the whole thing, and then that's how I, I think that's how I responded to you. Yeah. And anyway, that's how, that was the very first one, and that's how I got started. So um, there were all sorts of... Um, so we've used, as Dean said, all sorts of sources, but it started with those two items, a page from an old dictionary and something, an item from the newspaper, art, art related. And I think in, a, in its way, that the response that you sent is really emblematic of so much of the, both the kind of wit mm -hmm. that's in the project, mm -hmm. um, the, the way that it plays with language mm -hmm. and plays with, with the ways that we communicate, mm -hmm. but also does it with a, a great sense of humor which I think is, is really a, yeah. a constant and something that has become stronger over the, over the course of the, yeah. of the exchanges. Yeah. I really laugh at all Matt's jokes. And <laughs> I'm a good audience. He's really funny. And um, yes, so the humor is something that has found its way into practically, or wit or something, into every mailing. And I also think that it's interesting, um, the, it's important for you that um, both the, the individual mailings are not mm -hmm. attributed. So when you see the display, you'll see that we don't say which one was made by Matt or which one was made by Kay. It's really seen as a, as a kind of visual conversation that develops. And also you don't think of them as artworks per se. Right. And I, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the kind of sense of that, of that development and mm -hmm. how you've seen the kind of project develop over time, what kind of changes you've seen since it since it's started. Well, I, th I think that we both ag agree that it's gotten uh, looser since its inception. And, mm -hmm. um, that there was a kind of, um, I don't know about formality, but there was, it just wasn't as free form or as anything goes as the mailings have become, that it's much looser um, material decisions and, uh, that we use to, to respond is much more kind of free and open than it was seven years ago. And you can kind of see that in the vitrine that's next to the exit, that's the uh, most recent set of exchanges, um, and I do think it's a good example of you know seeing the variety of handmade to the printed out to the um, pre-existing you know found ephemeral components. Um, I think I think mats have always been more casual. I, I find I always mounted mine on cardboard, mm -hmm. and so they were a little more formal. And Matt mm -hmm. would just dump a bunch into an envelope, <laughs> like several things that I had to choose or respond to all of them, but they were much, more, yours were much more casual yeah. than mine were. Yeah, Kay I, always packed everything really nicely too. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think that there's like a, a, you know, parallel to be made to fluency, right? Mm -hmm. That the more you get to know someone, the more you understand each other, the more, there's more shorthand and the communication and inside jokes and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that um, there's just that ease because we know each other that much better, mm -hmm. um, you know, yeah. nine years later and seven years into the correspondence, that um, it's just easier. Um, 
and and it's it's become something that I really look forward to, with the understanding that um, I don't know what it will be. Like I've never been able to predict what part of my package, you know, that Kay will respond to. Because mm-hmm. oftentimes I'll send three or four things, or sometimes one thing, but. You know, if I send multiple things, you know, I'll say, oh, I think this is what Kay will, you know, connect with, but it's not necessarily the case. Um, And sometimes, you know, we both make decisions to redirect the exchange um, if a section goes on for a particularly long time or otherwise. So um, there's something really lovely to having this ongoing conversation that's not rooted in, in talking about it. It's really... Um, emphatically rooted in what's exchanged. But we don't think of it as precious, right? No. And I think that would be one way you would say it's not art, (laughs) if art can be considered more precious. Um, We don't consider it that way. We we consider it something not disposable and not quite ephemera, but probably closer to that than to artwork. And as we were talking talking about yesterday, um, you can't isolate them, really. I mean, they're dependent on each other. So they're not unique or singular works of art. They're, they're part of a stream. Yeah, but we take good care of them. You know, oh, yeah, we take really good care properly of them. Properly, and we yes. store them and, you know, have a sense of sequencing and all of that stuff. Yeah. And even kind of keeping them in the original envelopes, yes. which is, and you know, also the, it's, it was really nice to get them here and start to catalog everything and unpack everything. Because like Matt was saying, the care often that's taken in kind of wrapping things up and ensuring that they'll travel safely through the mail produces uh, some, yeah. some pretty beautiful, pretty beautiful objects. Yeah. I think though, one of the, one of the kind of other things, um, in terms of the in terms of the kind of conversations that are happening, mm-hmm. I think it's also interesting that the conversations um, start to take some turns, but in general, they're conversations between the two of you. Mm-hmm. You're not really talking about art history or current events, except in a maybe in a more kind of cursory way. Mm-hmm. And I think that idea also of developing a conversation that's mm-hmm. visual is quite an interesting one because in fact um, until other than maybe acknowledging receipt of a package from from each other mm-hmm. and saying oh I really liked that one y'all had not really talked in depth about the mailings until until we really started talking about the project no. is that right right we, we don't talk about it at all it's like it's like a parallel conversation. So when we meet and, and talk, have normal conversations, um, they never come up. Um, they're just something that goes on on the side, yeah. and uh, they're their own thing. Yeah, and it's important to note that it's not like within the mailings we're including a note or a letter to each other. There's yeah. no written correspondence that accompanies the material. So um, we just you know send an envelope or parcel of some sort that has the content similar to what you see in the vitrine. Um, but yeah, I mean, we only see each other every so often, so mm-hmm. there's so much stuff to catch up on. It's, yeah. Um, but it is interesting that it's a kind of unspoken decision. It's mm-hmm. not that we ever said, let's not talk about the mailings. We just don't talk right. about them because they have their own logic. Exactly. The rules are just sort of developed by them on their own. And over the over the eight years that it's been happening, I wonder if each of you might be able to identify kind of particular favorite moments oh, in the conversation or particular objects that you received from each other that that kind of might you know made you made you laugh or felt particularly poignant. I, I wish you had I, asked me ahead so I could <laughs> scroll through my memory. Well, I would just say just to keep it more relevant to what's here mm-hmm. just to not talk about stuff that we don't we don't have mm-hmm. i i feel like the passage that's closer to the visibility that's starts with the images of the bees and works its way to the um on off eyes that was um a particular example where i felt like we really had hit our stride because there are certain passages where um 
it was just so fun because we were building on each other's mm-hmm. previous mailings that it really felt like, you know, a kind of contagious conversation where you just like really want to keep talking. Mm-hmm. Um, and I feel like that's a good example. But within the three vitrines, I, I really like the moments um, where there's, you know, where I can tell that Kay's pulling from Studio Ephemera or where I'm pulling yeah. from Studio it's Ephemera. Like, it's like the kiss one. Yeah, this ki- the, the one over that's there, by the door. Right. When, when Matt sent uh, this cutout, you'll see it in black, black a dark green? It's or a dark green. Dark green. Yeah. Um, Under the circulation. Um, well, between circulation. Um, and it said, keep it simple, stupid, and cut out and reflected like a, a brush off test mm-hmm. sort of. Uh, I was so excited because I have been saving, I saved junk, and um, I had these old newspaper pictures of Kiss from 78. Is yeah. that what it's from? 78. 78. Yeah. I thought, finally a chance to do something <laughs> with it. So anyway, that was my response back to Matt. And yeah. I love I love that moment, that passage. Yeah, which happens every so often, like the mailing that I have to remember to give to Kay before she leaves yes. is in response to her last mailing, and parts of it are from photos that I took, I want to say, in 2008, something like that, 2007 or 8. So they're just like parts of contact prints um, that I've incorporated to this most recent mailing. So sometimes stuff is just around you, mm-hmm. and then all of a sudden you see a something and think, there, I can use this. Yeah. It's a great way of recycling. When in fact, each of you have kind of talked about small piles of things that you keep mm-hmm. around the studio yeah. that, are, that are kind of really, you know, things that you know that you're excited about mm-hmm. that might kind of make their way into the conversation. And mm-hmm. Matt, I think you had even mentioned at one point in the interview that it's a, it's a really great practice if you're feeling kind of stuck yeah. in the studio. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think... Um, For all artists, you go through points of productivity or kind of frustration that something's not clicking. Um, And I think that Kay and I share this and that we're happiest when we're working um, and that in that kind of interim period, it's nice to have this correspondence as a kind Mm -hmm. of um, generator of ideas or trying something out. Um, Mm -hmm. And sometimes... um, what we're actually working on in the moment makes its way into the mailings and other times I've had you know multiple situations over seven years where I've just been so annoyed with whatever it is I'm working on or not happy with something that I made um, and have real pleasure in what I'm making for Kay um, that that helps alleviate that feeling or kind of put out that fire of a feeling of like, why isn't this working, or why can't I figure this out? Um, it and, makes you it makes you feel productive, yeah. even though you know in a periods where you're not, yeah, you feel like even, you've at least accomplished that. Yeah, and knowing that it's for you know su- such an intimate audience that it's just mm-hmm. for each other that there's right. also pleasure in that, and not having the kind of bigger stresses of like. What will the show be like? What will the, right you know. less less risk? Yeah, <laughs> and also because um, even though it's it is a project that started out for a kind of an audience of one, let's mm-hmm. say, um, and you had never intended to kind of show the work publicly. So mm-hmm. I do feel that we're we're really fortunate here to have access to that very kind of intimate exchange. Mm-hmm. Um, I also um, to kind of make a bit of a segue into some of the works that we're seeing in the gallery. I think that um, the selection of works that we have from the mailings um, is really materially quite rich. So you see um, different ways of kind of using found objects, um, some of the cut paper pieces that eventually um, have kind of migrated from Matt into into some of the powder-coated steel pieces, mm-hmm. um, or also the different ways, Kay, that you're that you're playing with language. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that one of the things that we were particularly interested to do here was to also kind of create um, this wall behind us, which we've been calling the salon wall, to create a, a bit of a of a segue or a bridge 
from those mailings um, between the other individual works that you see, the, the wall paintings and sculptures that are also displayed around the gallery. Um, and I wonder maybe if we can just talk a little bit about some of the, some of the works here and that kind of relationship, because I think here we get a, a sense of the kind of diversity of mm -hmm. some of the media and some of the ways that you're approaching media. Um, for instance, Kay, we have a, a drawing here, also a painting, cast bronzes. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the different media that you're... Um, primarily, uh, I paint and draw. I, I would, and there are some other you know, things like collage that I mentioned, but I think those are my two main um, ways of working. And um, the, and as you guessed or know, uh, I work with language. My background is languages, linguistics. So when I, that was academic background. So when I began making art, uh, I, that was the, the first image that I made was language. So you'll, you know, naturally it's, it's carried through in, in all my work. So um, I guess as far, do you want me to talk about the content or just the materials or? We could talk about yeah, the content as yeah. well. I, um, I guess, oh, do you really want, okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, the works, well, I guess starting with the one on, on the um, left, backtrack um, is just a series. I'm interested in how, I won't go through it in detail, but I'm interested in how language and meaning um, come together, kind of they conflate and reinforce each other. And so when I discover something in language where its form and its um, function or meaning, you know, are closely related, I mean, to me, that's uh, like a, a eureka moment for me. But Backtrack, um, and I, didn't, I don't know if I should give it away, but you could read the title, but it's just an example of how when you write Backtrack and then you backtrack over it, there's something performative about it, it kind of obliterates what you've written before, um, which is what happens when people actually do Backtrack, whether verbally or physically they sort of wipe out what went before or they contradict it. And, but the only letter that does not, that doesn't, isn't obscured is the T. And it's just one, it's like a system. You know, there's just these systems sort of embedded in language and when they emerge, I think it's exciting. Yeah, I think, Kate, one of the things that, that we've talked a bit about is this idea of the architecture mm -hmm. of language. Yes. Um, and I think that something, that sense of the architecture of language is very apparent in um, LOL, uh -huh. which we see on the opposite side of this wall. Right. In addition to the structure of words, the structure of letters is also important to me. And so just crossbars on an A and an H are at different heights, at least in this font, which I use a lot. Um, and so by lining them all up, you have this sort of up and down movement of ha ha ha. And I sort of always thought of it as like, you know, you have this sort of belly laugh when you're laughing, you're sort of you know, really laughing, kind of going up and down. But then, but then what, you had another suggestion, or Matt had another suggestion okay. about that yesterday. It looks like a heartbeat. Oh, right, yes, like a, yes, like a lifeline type, yeah. Yeah, I mentioned that I yeah. thought it was also like kind of people laughing, like leaning yeah. against a bar yeah. together. So painting on canvas and painting or drawing on paper are my two form, form, favorite forms of expression. Um, they're similar to the page and they're similar to a sign and the more intimate ones are, more sim are similar to a page and sort of within the scope of a body, you know. And Kay, if we also, if talking about the kind of language of architecture, mm -hmm. I think we could also talk um, a bit about the, the wall paintings as okay. a kind of architecture of, of language. Uh -huh. So there we see the scale greatly increased. Mm -hmm. um, we had the, the incredible opportunity to work with Stephen Reynolds, who is a sign painter, who Kay has been working with since about 1996? 90. About 90 or 91, yeah. 
um, who came here um, and over the course of a week um, executed two of Kay's wall paintings as well as a, a wall painting for Matt. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what brought you to, to that use of, of how to deploy language? Um, I think that increasing the scale isn't always appropriate for a fragment of language. But they're always pretty succinct fragments, their words, or very short phrases. But sometimes I feel like it's necessary to turn up the volume, in a sense, on a certain message. And when I do want to turn up the volume, then an appropriate format would be a wall painting. And um, so in both of these cases, I felt that was the case, although they have both existed originally as small pieces. In fact, She Man was, from, was originally from 1996 and was a small model like this. It was from the same period. And, um, but it's a, it's a message that I feel need, you know, can, can be broadcast loud, more loudly. So anyway, that's at the end of visibility too, where um, it was just one of those found words, which is so amazing because the eyes function as dividers between all of the, each of the consonants. And I, I really didn't do much except figure out how to visually present it and change the, t uh, the, t the Y to an I on the last uh, vowel. But uh, it's, you know, that's just the, the best thing when that happens, when the work is sort of self-made, and all I do is sort of pluck it out of the, the stream of, of language. And, and, and She Man was the same way, where you had this column. I mean, I think of it as that way, as sort of this column of male pronouns, he, 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 and that the female, the, the letters that made the pronouns feminine, S and the R, her and she, were in the margins of, of that work. Anyway, um, so I just, that's sort of how they become large, I guess, depending on how I view the importance of the message. However, this piece was actually done as in Aspen when they were building the new museum in Aspen, and they wanted um, a sort of barricade-type wall to, uh, you know... Uh, around the construction. Around the construction site. And so when they talked to me about it, we did one of these, just keep in, peek out, as this huge, like, barricade that was around the new museum site until it was completed. So anyway, they, they can, you know, transform into other formats. Mm -hmm. And Kay, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting about walls, um, mm -hmm. you know, this, this kind of symmetry of keep in, peek out, keep out, peek in, mm -hmm. is also something, Matt, that I think occurs in your work um, and occurs in the kind of ways that you're playing with language, specifically in a piece like the work behind us, KK. And I wonder if you can kind of talk about those ideas of symmetry and how you're finding it in that particular language, especially given your kind of experiences with growing up in a family that was somewhat bilingual. Yeah, well, to the... Um the relationship between walls, which is the title of Kay's work here, and or negative, which is um, the work cut into sheetrock. Um, I also really liked, in addition to this, the symmetry, the kind of um, need for the two parts with or that structurally seems as if the O will go into the neck of the R, um, which um, both exists as the structure of the two letters to make the word, and then also the necessary rear wall as the kind of existent wall versus the um, built wall. Um, it worked out really well, both in relationship to walls and also to border piece to have this formal affinity between um, the way the works are presented. But in terms of the symmetry for both more like um, and for KK behind me, um, I'm really interested, when I work with text in my own work, I'm interested in um, the symmetry of phrases. So the same number of letters in the words more and like, and the same number of letters with mother and father, um, and with what and that um, being a letter 
different um, between the two words. Um, so when I'm dealing with phrases, oftentimes I'm looking at them in terms of their architecture and building a shape or um, what the repetition allows and when a word becomes another word or uh, points at which that what and that become a kind of um, illegible third word or um, where hat comes in or at or um, other parts of a word to create a more abstract patterning. Um, but symmetry I think of as being foundational to thinking about how artwork exists within a gallery as well, that since it's a predominantly ocular experience, that your body is perpendicular to the floor and parallel to the wall, and that there's a symmetry in your two eyes looking at something, your two arms, your two feet, your two legs, um, and thinking about that within work um, is really interesting to me and also interesting in thinking about installation of how does, um, how do you remind a body that its eyes are connected to two feet so that there's a, a vertical relationship or thinking about folds that happen in work that replicates a kind of folding of the body or um, relationship between arms and legs or so um, that's things I think a lot about in my work, whether I'm making something on a smaller scale or making something on a larger scale. And I think that that kind of idea of the connection between the eyes and feet is something that's very present for me um, in the work circulation back mm -hmm. there, which actually kind of suggests a motility for the viewer. So as you stand to one side, you see the word circulation in one font as you as it kind of asks you to move around, you're able to see it in a, in a second font. And then there is that moment in the middle where there's a, a kind of jumbled long word. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you can kind of talk about that sense of, of actually the work almost, the reading requiring movement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that work, um, it works and can live as, um, its own separate sculpture, but it's important in terms of thinking about that mobility. Um, the show that it was a part of was a show called I Apple New York, and um, the um, work was constructed in a way that there is a frieze that went around the entirety of this, the exhibition space. So there were, were these um, horizontal four foot wide by eight foot long um, steel flats that were colored um, in the colors that are used to paint the bridges in the five boroughs of Manhattan. So along these flat panels there were four photographs affixed to each four by eight. So there were 60 photographs that wrapped around the entirety of the gallery. Um, and the circulation um, sign was installed at the point of entry and exit of the, the gallery space. Um, so there is this very particular rhythm of how you move through the space and looking at these images. And then there were also sculptures that were made by taking the four by eight flat and folding it to make these different dimensional sculptures. So the, um, the fold and accordion shape of the circulation sign and also both the reflection and the abstraction of the phrase of the word as Dean's pointing out all worked so well within that installation but to contextualize the sign it's a replica of um, the circulation de desk signage at the mid Manhattan branch of the New York Public Library um, and for that exhibition I, I made a book um, that was riffing on the Rick Burns documentary called New York that I'm sure many of you have watched. It was a seven part PBS series. And I made an image only version of that series um, where 95% of the images came from the picture collection that's a defunct part of the New York Public Library. And um, the branch that housed the picture collection had this signage as its circulation, at its circulation desk. So. That's just to give you some idea of the space that it once inhabited, but um, as its own work within this exhibition, we knew that it would work really well with divisibility, um, but then also within a, an exhibition that revolves around a correspondence, there's also something really nice in the two fonts that, you know, 
work together and blend together, um, but also have kind of different sides of um, each triangle of the accordion. Um, so it worked, we knew from the outset that it would work well within this context. The rhythm between uh, that and divisibility is, is an intentional, I mean the placement is an intentional, just like the ambiguity between the ambiguity between um, she-man and more like mother, more like father. The mm -hmm. ambiguity in gender is also relational. That's why we put them next to each other. Yeah, I think over the course of this exhibition, we actually had so much fun kind of having these conversations, looking at selections of, of mm -hmm. work, and really kind of talking through these ideas of, of how things related mm -hmm. um, from one to the other. And I think even once we got in here, there were a lot of kind of unexpected mm -hmm. relationships as right. well between works. Um, I think one of the things actually that was, that was also kind of really special um, is that one of the works, Kay, um, your border piece, which mm -hmm. is on the, on the far wall in this space, um, was one that both Matt and I identified very early on as something that we were really interested in and yes. excited to see. And you and Bud were kind enough to to do a little excavating at home and to and to bring out a piece that had not been seen in about 32 years, mm -hmm. right? Right. Yes, I was really grateful to both of you for thinking it and pushing it because I was like, are you sure? <laughs> it's been you know, wrapped up and stored behind a furnace for, well, <laughs> next to a furnace, for, you know, for that long. So it was, it was a little scary bringing it out, but it was exciting. And I was really relieved to see that it still, you know, it was functional. <laughs> and so the, the first time that you had exhibited it, it was shown in the windows at uh -huh. the new museum at the old location that was on Broadway. Yes, yes. Um, and it was made in 1984. Yes. Um, and made very much in response to the kind of intervention, U.S. interventions that were happening in Central and South America. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about, about the kind of motivations behind behind making the piece and the kind of significances that, right. that you might attribute to some of the use of language that's in it? Um, well, it was, um, it was a very political, well, every, every era is a political time, but there was something about the 80s that it seemed like so much was going on, you know, Iran-Contra and the dictator, the coups in South and Central America and just things happening all over, but it, it uh, I've always been sort of drawn to political situations and interested in them. So it was a pl it, so it was an example of one that really manifested itself strongly in the art. And what it was referring to specifically was these dictatorships, as I mentioned, in Central and South America, and practically every country, Argentina and Brazil and Chile and Uruguay and Ecuador, and it was really all over. Um, and, you know, the repression of human rights, civil rights, and worse, um, you know, kidnappings and murder and torture. And um, anyway, I was quite disturbed by all that. And so this piece has to do a lot with that. It had everything to do with that. And also, though, with the kind of surveillance, um, citizen surveillance and more formal governmental surveillance, uh, in which people just lived in a constant state of fear of, you know, being kidnapped and they called them desaparecidos. They just disappeared. Um, there are still repercussions from that going on today uh, in those countries, actually. Commissions that are still trying to bring justice to some of the uh, events. So the, the texts using Spanish, English, and a little French um, have to do with, those, with the, that situation. And... The walls, the, you know, kind of the telescoping walls as sort of being um, the things that divided people, the things hid, people hid behind, that concealed. Um, so that was all wrapped up, the form and the content in what I was trying to describe. Um, but I do think, I mean, as, as people have said, and I also have mentioned that it, it is very relevant today because some of the, maybe not specifically, but the kind of surveillance and fear and certain things are still, you know, recycling today. Mm -hmm. And I think in, 
as a kind of combination to that, the, the way that the piece uses kind of flatness mm -hmm. um, is something that, Matt, I feel like you really exploit oftentimes in your work with the, the play that you're using with photographic imagery mm -hmm. or in a work like Yellow Great with images printed atop or in front of photographic imagery and really playing with these ideas of, of where the plane mm -hmm. kind of exists. And so I think there's a, a real combination there that's a quite yeah. a, a rich correspondence. And I wonder if you can maybe talk a little bit about those, because you're, you're using these, this kind of flatness or exploiting this flatness in, a, in quite a different way. Yeah, yeah, I think that um, I don't, I have an interdisciplinary art background, so my undergraduate studies I focused more on painting and then came to sculpture by a painting, um, but I, because I was dealing with painting and drawing as a kind of foundational way of making things, um, my entrance to photography and my entrance to sculpture um, came through this, you know, plane of information, whether it was a drawn or painted or photographic plane. So um, my approach to um, moving into sculpture was really thinking about layers of flat material and you know, things like or are really, a work like or is emblematic of that, of um, creating space by cutting into that particular flat plane or with more like creating a portal-like space that's, you know, just an optical trick by the um, changing of the scale and placement of the font. But with the work behind me, um, Dean is mentioning Yellow Great, um, and thinking about photographs, um, my interest in a series of photos that I made where I'm photographing material that I'm encountering on the sidewalk. Um, again, this, inf this relationship between the eyes and the feet, um, I became really interested in the plexi component of a frame, that it's material that is arbitrary, that you look through, um, and it you know, serves a protective purpose with UV plexi. But um, I was interested in the idea of using that material to replicate a component of the photograph. So you may not be able to tell from back there, but I've extracted the yellow of the um, Han and Great and printed that specifically on the plexiglass so it creates this visual stutter between the yellow of the Great and also makes the space deeper as a result because there is this additional layer of material. Um, and I've made a couple of photographs using this process um, that, stem, that really comes out of early collages where I was building up the layers of material, um, you know, layer upon layer of a, of a photograph. So, I don't know, they all, I worked a lot with sheetrock um, from 2004 to say 2011 um, and it was this perfect material because it's paper-like, it's architectural, it's structural, um, and it's easy to, to print on, to build on, to layer. Um, so, yeah, a work like um, Border Piece, I feel a real formal affinity in the way that it's made because, um, yeah, that ability to kind of imagine peeling it away or physically peeling it away is interests me. I have to say, so, you know, I was, this piece here is also like either on either side of a plane, mm -hmm. the glass being the plane. So on one side you're peeking out and one side you're peeking in, keeping out, peeking in. And I was just, I never realized that, but how it closely is related to this where the glass functions as part of the piece. Yeah. Or the plexi. Yeah, that membrane. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's also it's also a, a kind of nice revelation mm -hmm. in looking at things about thinking about this flatness mm -hmm. and the ways that both of you are using flat the flatness and kind of working with it, against it, mm -hmm. and also using language to really kind of reach out towards a viewer and to mm -hmm. and to pull someone into the work. Yeah, it's I feel, quite generous. I feel a, a kinship with Kay in terms of our articulation of language as found material, because mm -hmm. I definitely feel an affinity with the way that I think about language, but also in a work like this, that the photographic material is things that exist in the world. They're, you know, 
so, it's something that I walked across in Red Hook where I had a studio at the time and where my photo printer is um, and thinking about these things that exist in the world and then um, there's some type of evidentiary quality when it exists within photography in particular.